um, planting season in September, October worked very tirelessly on the discussion zone and um, towards uh, producing maize. With very much high hopes and determination of producing enough maize to take care of our family and then sell a few excess. However, a couple of months ago, when this picture was taken, she stood helplessly looking at her fields being ravaged in a couple of days by the El Nino conditions. This um, condition is a very tricky thing that affected a lot of countries within Southern Africa and a few other uh, places. And she's definitely not alone. In Malawi alone, 9 million Malawians were affected by this and over more than 170,000 hectares of maize crop were affected, leaving a lot of people um, without food over the hunger season and the next couple of months. Normally when situations like this happen, African governments, one of the ways they try to solve this is introducing seeds and fertilizer subsidies. And because this is the circumstance, not only for my nest, but also a lot of sub-Saharan African countries, that becomes the default um, looking very desperately to ministries of agriculture. What support are you going to provide us so that we can either grow a second plant in season or have food um, for our families? However, when you look on the flip side, on the government side, who are supposed to make these decisions and see who is going to benefit because obviously they can't support everyone in the corridors of power where these critical decisions are to be made it becomes a very difficult thing um these decisions that could either make or break the livelihoods of smallholder farmers are being made with very much fragmented data and sometimes absolute or non even very, just based on politics of who gets what. So farmers really wait for subsidies and it becomes very difficult for them to access this. And one of the reasons for this is because governments struggle to know who do you support and how do you identify who, who to support. As Boniface was saying earlier in today, this morning session, you can't help someone transition when you do actually don't know the person. And that becomes the case for a lot of smallholder farmers where we sit in, uh, we, we make decisions, but don't actually know who to target. And part of the problem is because data on smallholder farmers is scattered in several places across departments. FA would have their own data. Um, other NGOs would have their own data. Ministries of Agriculture tend to have even the least of data among the partners. In all, this is, when you look at this, it's not really a logistical issue. It's a life altering um, challenge because you're making decisions on behalf of Manes and millions of other people who are looking to get their support. Working with African government um, over the last couple of uh, years in my career made me realize one of the things that some of these decision makings are uh, inherently very, very complex. There's several uh, decisions at play, multiple layers of bureaucracy even. And then there's complex political economy, especially when it comes to subsidy programs. There's always a focus to, um, to just move ahead to just short term thinking, think about the politics rather than how would you help these farmers transition out of subsistence farming and sustainable growth as a whole. And I've also worked with other leaders where really keen on making some of this decision based on evidence, but they turn to partners and to their directors but there is no data. 
uh, what they have is probably as old as the last census that was done. So you're making real-time decisions on very outdated um, information or sometimes none at all. And in agriculture, it could mean the difference between widespread food security because you've had disasters and pest uh, infestation and so many other things or mitigating a food security crisis. So my question that I'm hoping to answer and pose to the rest of the audience is, how can we expect to feed a growing population that are facing climate extremes, economic situation, if the very foundation of our decision-making is built on anecdotal data or information? How? Today, I will share how data and technology is revolutionizing service delivery in Malawi and how that can be an example for government to embrace data and technology to improve service delivery. In Malawi, um, subsidy programs has been there since the 1950s. They've operated several rounds of subsidy program and have been given several names. Each administration calls it very differently. Two things that has been changed between 1950 to now is the name of the program and how many people they are supporting. Everything else pretty much remains the same on how you identify farmers and who benefits and the logistics and all of that. But between 10, 2010, 12, up to even 2018, it worked very well for them. And production and productivity increased, which is really good until it plateaued at some point because of several other factors. But it still remains a very, very much difficult part of the, um, of the economy. And it takes up to 50% of the, the budget. But lately it's been criticized for inefficiencies and resource allocation and corruption and so many other things. Through collaborative efforts with private sector donor partners, um, or the, the development partners, we held a very uh, a one week session to understand what are the root cause of this, uh, the problem with the current subsidy program. And one of the things that we identified was the problem with targeting who should benefit from the current subsidy program. That led to a couple of changes. One, we realized the smaller farmers in Malawi are not homogeneous. Even though they're all referred to, or almost all are referred to smaller farmers, you have a lot that fall within thresholds that should really not get subsidy, but actually have other types of support. So we changed that and also changed the eligibility. We had one clear directive, implement a data-driven approach to beneficiary targeting. But then we came back to the same problem. Well, what data do we use? So we didn't have much. We first took a look at an assessment of what data is available within government and uh, uh, private sector uh, and also other departments and realized there were several data sets. And what we did after the assessment was to move everything and integrate into one holistic database that gave us up to 5 million um, farm, uh, farmers, but also taking bits and pieces of everything that is needed to have a holistic idea of who are the farmers in Malawi and what do they need? From that, we move into having, um, having a clustering to understand how do you segment the different smallholder farmers and what are their needs, and then develop a machine learning based algorithm that help to identify dynamically within the context of what are their needs and who benefits. And it was it helped us to actually narrow down the eligibility and make it difficult uh, and change that from district to district who benefits from uh, the subsidy program. With that, it was it made it easier for us to now select 1.5 million farmers that benefited. And afterwards, 
all the other people that were within the subsidy, about a million more were moved to cash transfer programs because they were very much within the lower the thresholds uh, of production and productivity. So even if you give them X bag of seeds and fertilizer, they're still not gonna be able to feed their families. And, and that helped to create a, a very much um, a registry that helps um, base the, the base for innovation and much more targeted support to the sector. A couple of things that, 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 that we learned from the, um, this experience is one, integration of very siloed and disparate solutions really helped to create a data-driven decision. And it gives you a broader picture of the sector and who are the farmers. And then you can harness machine learning and AI to help you tailor your support and reimagine what your uh, service delivery is to the country. But also because this was a very data intensive, you're dealing with 5 million records, we needed to also get access to adequate infrastructure to deploy these machine learning models, which not all governments um, tend to set up or even look at as a need. The other piece is building the capabilities to manage these models, to keep it going, and also build the capacity within government to take this forward, not just as a one-year project. But then being inclusive and adaptive. We tried initially, um, almost all the previous years, they've had one eligibility criteria for the entire country. And from the segmentation and clustering, we realized what is a productive farmer in the Southern region is different from a productive farmer in the Northern region. So we tweak our algorithms to be very much context specific to the district to select who's the most productive in that region that should benefit. Data quality. One of the things that's, uh, one of the biggest problem with uh, collecting data for registries, people either inflate their circumstances or reduce it because they want to be part. So we had a few isolated instances where the algorithm didn't quite work or found there wasn't people to support because people had underreported. And this was a challenge and it's something that we're hoping to correct in this year uh, um, of the rollout. So in conclusion, I will say the revolution of data, it's not for Silicon Valley or for private sector only. It's very much here for developing countries to also leverage um, for uh, better decisions and service delivery. And Malawi's journey is a really an example of how do you reimagine decision-making within government from very much politics to a very uh, or, uh, objective and data-driven decision-making. And integrating data system and leveraging analytics is a very helpful thing um, that can create tailored policies and strategies that would drive the needed impact that you want to see within your economy. And last, we should realize that the decisions we make in the boardrooms far away from the farms for these smallholder farmers could make or break the farmer's livelihood. So it should be informed by the latest evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harold. So we can take a couple of questions in the interest of time, if anybody has any question. If not, then we'll move to the next session. So I welcome now Henry Mibai from CABI. He'll be speaking on navigating the data landscape for maximum impact in agriculture projects. Over to you, Henry.
Good afternoon once again. I am I'm sorry, I'm hoping I'm going to take uh, 15 minutes. I can see the moderator is really cautious uh, of time. Good. So my session, I will be talking about uh, navigating the data landscape for maximum impact in agriculture uh, projects. So I think today's uh, session, we know that uh, the current dynamic uh, architectural landscape uh, data serves as the most important asset in driving our project's uh, success and also in uh, making informed uh, decision uh, making, including strategic planning. So one thing I want to do in this session is to share some of the lessons uh, we have learned in, in, in implementing enabling data pro uh, access project in Ethiopia and also uh, give highlights of uh, what we did and what uh, worked best. I am presenting on behalf of the team. This is a, a collaborative uh, work that we did. And the team uh, there, they were not able to uh, attend, but I will be speaking on behalf of the team. So before I dive in into what we did, I would like to just uh, make a brief uh, overview of what we do at Kabi, who we are. So we, we are an intergovernmental or not-for-profit uh, organization. We work with 49 member countries across uh, the world, 17 of them uh, in Africa. And mainly we solve our problems in agriculture and the environment. And one thing that uh, we do most around our data is that uh, we offer impact services that enable uh, more collection, storing, sharing, of our data. And how we do this is that we help organizations to improve their data management uh, practices and also adhering to the fair data principles, which I'm going to highlight and also share some of the lessons. Here. So we've worked with uh, currently working on the enabling data access uh, project. And this is a project that is funded uh, by the Bin and Menin Gates uh, Foundation, where we are looking to address uh, problems relating to data sharing within the projects. So here we are looking at problems around data sharing within the projects. But first I would like to highlight uh, Ethiosis move to Ethiopia and talk about Ethiosis, one of the projects that uh, was funded by the Gates uh, Foundation and where we collaborated with uh, other uh, stakeholders to make sure that uh, data was uh, being uh, shared. So in, in 2012, the Gates Foundation and also the government of Ethiopia invested close to 5 uh, million US dollars to develop uh, a data uh, repository. And when at the end of the deployment of that uh, system, there was a problem because data was not being shared. So it means that the investment that had been made was going to go into a waste. So imagine an investment of 5 million US dollars being made into a project, but afterwards, they, you'll find that it is not being used. So they were asking themselves, what really happened? So Ethiosis was launched in 2012, and it was uh, launched by the Ethiopians Agricultural Transformation Agency which offered a comprehensive uh, soil information uh, uh, platform. But again, from that, the national soil information system is what emerged from Ethiosis. So you can see from the right side is a landscape because Ethiosis sits within a data landscape. There are so many actors within Ethiosis. So when they established Ethiosis, there were so many partners. There was the donor, there were the government, they were the data contributors, they were the data users, so many actors within the Ethiosis. But one thing is that the system was developed or the platform was developed, but it was not being used. So we ask ourselves, why was it not uh, being used? And I will first go to this slide that I want to look at. What is wrong with how we work with data? So before we even go back to Ethiosis and for me to highlight the enabling data uh, access project on how we worked uh, on that uh, project to make sure that uh, uh, data sharing happened within Ethiosis. So let me highlight what is wrong with how we work with data. So you'll find that uh, a lot of 
donors are investing billions of uh, dollars into projects. But the problem is that there is an issue with good data management. It is not being considered. So projects are being developed, but good data management practices are not factored in at the word go when the project is uh, starting. So you'll find that again, billions are invested in research, but the investments or those projects are not sustainable because there's a lot of duplication. So you'll find that one project has collected data, but now another project is emerging and is going to collect the same data. So I would say duplication of uh, efforts. Then again, at the end of the project, you will find that data is not being used because data management was not put in as a priority. So we have billions of dollars invested into a project, but they have not factored in good data management uh, practice. And again, even the policies are, de uh, are even uh, developed, they are not always informed by appropriate uh, consultation and evidence. So policies are developed but they are not in country. So then how or why is FAIR good uh, for data rich uh, projects? So I'm now introducing uh, a concept that is the FAIR data uh, framework that we used in Ethiopia and the enabling data access uh, a project. So why is FAIR then good for data rich uh, uh, projects? So FAIR, FAIR is a globally recognized uh, framework that can help organizations to make data rich investments more sustainable and deliver greater return on investments. So again, if you look at, on the right uh, uh, left-hand side of, of my uh, screen is that for all those projects that invest or they are built in, they have incorporated FAIR, you will find that they'll have return on investment. And FAIR, for example, for any data that is findable, you'll find that it, it reduces or it, you'll not be able to duplicate. So you are able to save time and money. Accessibility, any data that is accessible, you are able, it promotes inclusivity and also knowledge sharing. And then the interoperability aspect, we need to combine data sets so that we're able to add value to those data sets. And any reusable data, it means that we're able to reduce uh, costs. Now let's go back to the Ethiopia challenge. So I talked about the government investing support from the Gates Foundation, investing millions of uh, dollars, but there was a problem where the system or data was not being reused. So the government, with technical support from uh, AFSIS, that is the Africa Soil Information System uh, project, implemented Ethiosis. But it, data from Ethiosis project was not accessible or reusable by the national uh, partners. So you'll find that when they were developing the Ethiosis, they didn't consider other users of the data sets. And again, there was no policy that would drive the use of data. So a policy would allow or would empower within the project, would empower different stakeholders to share the data. Now applying the FAIR principles, this is now where we came in with the enabling data access project to apply the FAIR principles so that we could understand the data itself that needs to be shared understand the enabling environment. I think today we've talked about enabling environment where we need to consider that before we develop a system, we need to know what policies exist, uh, who, who are the people within the ecosystem that exist. I'm cautious of time. These are the partners that we collaborated with to implement or to develop the ethiosis in Ethiopia. So it's not only CABI alone that uh, worked to, to, to help the data management within the ethiosis. Within the CABI uh, enabling data access project, so what we did to make sure that data was now being shared is that we first started to understand the data landscape, focusing on the people, process, and also not technology itself, 
So we need to understand who are the users of this uh, system. We need to understand the process, the policies, but not the technology that has been developed. And also prioritizing on developing the policy itself that would enable data sharing. As I conclude, then what, we, what did we learn out of this? We need to have a stepwise uh, process to integrate uh, FAIR into the projects from the start, especially prioritizing the in-country environment, the enabling environment, and also recognizing the local buying. We need support from the government. Ethios is let alone worked and is now the uh, National Soil Information System. It's because the government of Ethiopia supported it. And then also making sure that there is capacity building training the data scientists so that they, they are able to share data, they understand. So the co-creation of tools, that is the policies and the, 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 the like data, data, data management that needs to be co-created so that they take ownership. So in terms of the impact, uh, what uh, we achieved is that we were able to develop the soil and agronomy data sharing policy, which at the moment is currently being uh, used in Ethiopia. And we raised awareness of uh, fair data benefits beyond agriculture, influencing our broader policies and practices. And in Ethiopia, there is a, what we call coalition of the win willing. It's a volunteer network, a group of uh, people and institutions, organizations that have come together to make sure that they are able to share data. And Ethiopia, as I said, finally is now made as the national soil information system. So this is the FAIR uh, framework that we uh, applied, and I'll be happy to take you through this uh, process afterwards, I'm cautious of, uh, of time. And this six step uh, process is what we applied to the ethiosis to make sure that uh, now data was being uh, reused. From the point of defining data intervention types, making sure that we empower the grantees or those starting the projects to articulate how data will feature in the project and how to address it. Understanding the enabling environment. So you can see from the first step up to the uh, sixth step, all this has been condensed and following these steps would make sure that projects have good uh, data uh, management. So it means that you'll not be able to develop a project or investment that would just sit. At the end of it, we need to share uh, data. I'll be happy to answer our questions, but if you have any other questions, we'd be happy to, to share it with uh, our team. Thank you. Any questions? You can use the mic. Yeah. Thank you. This is uh, Mark Ndonga from the Kenya Space Agency. A wonderful presentation, and it's interesting how you can take uh, an implemented project and try and align it with FAIR. My question was, how long did that process take and what's the indicative cost? Because for most government institutions, we'd want to know how much it will take, uh, how, what the resources that we need to deploy for this to be done. Thank you, that's a very good uh, question. So Ethiosis was launched in 2012 and its development uh, ended close to 20, uh, 14, 15, 16 there. But now Kabi was brought in, we were brought in to look into the issues of sharing data, that was in 2018. And that is when now we started understanding the issues around uh, ethiosis, uh, the data share, uh, sharing problems. So from 2018 up to now uh, 2020 is when we were able to come up with uh, 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 resolutions or recommendations for to address uh, those challenges. So I can say that it takes, uh, it takes time because first we need to understand the enabling environment. But if from the word go, the donor or even uh, private institutions factor in good data management before they start a project, I don't think there would be a problem. Thanks. I think fair, fair is great. And um, the I, the interoperability, I, I tend to see guys, uh, initiatives getting stuck in the inter interoperability part, especially the semantic one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I'm just curious, within in Ethiopia, do you have to deal with that particular issue of 
uh, and, uh, inter interoperability yeah. between mm -hmm. what is stored in the machines mm -hmm. so that they can speak to each other. Did you have to, for instance, uh, adopt an, on an ontology yes. so that both systems are using the same ontology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question again. So I will not be able to answer correctly, but I think uh, having the right uh, policies and also guidelines that would uh, guide data uh, uh, data stewards or those handling data to share the data. So documenting those, um, I would say, uh, practices would make sure that uh, um, people who are, who are sharing the data would be able to follow those uh, practices. But I'll be I'll be happy to catch up and then we explore that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Henry. Um, we have our next presenter, Alexander Valetin, from Elder. He'll be speaking on the digital confusion data and data management for agriculture made easy. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Valaton, and I am representing Yielder. I'll do a super short uh, introduction uh, about who I am and what Yielder is. We set up Yielder in 2017. I myself, I derive from the uh, media communication business. We are having a, we have a production company and I have that since 2008 or something here in Kenya. And before that I had it in Asia. Um, and we were making a lot of videos and uh, information on agriculture. And then at one moment I found out that there is a lot of knowledge everywhere in the world on agriculture and farmers need that knowledge, but there was a communication gap between the two. So I thought, and again, I don't have any agriculture background. So I thought like, well, why don't we just translate it, that academic knowledge into something that farmers can use? Everybody must, must like that. NGOs must like it because we reach bigger groups. Universities must like it because that's what they do it for. Farmers must like it because suddenly they've got the knowledge. So we started doing that and that was quite successful, except that there was no money model which was a bit annoying. Um, but we had, by that time, quite a big database of farmers and quite a big database of knowledge and a good network of NGOs, companies that we were working with and for. And we decided to change it around a little bit and develop blended learning trainings for these NGOs, meaning making trainings, making them super attractive by adding videos and games and uh podcasts and all the multimedia stuff that you can imagine and train trainers in the field and they train farmers uh, that model is working super well so now we have a company that's called yielder consisting of three silos pillars first one is developing trainings second one is having a whole network of this kind of young guys who we train to be trainers and then third is, of course, data. Because since we have those guys in the field, we can collect a lot of data. And contrary to when a farmer with his thick fingers full of mud is putting his data in small smartphone, the data we are collecting is very clean because these guys, they are tech savvy, they're smart, they have done it before, they know how to ask the right questions to the farmers. and that works very well. Now, I have to read my own slides. We have an outreach of about 100, 000, uh, 180,000 farmers at this moment. We've been training about 100,000, 120,000 farmers. We have that ext uh, extension network where we have now 450 trained boys and girls like this. And I hope by the end of this year, we have 10,000. That's uh, quite a big figure, but 
I think we're going to, going to get there. Um, and more and more, we are focusing on sustainable farming and telling farmers how to uh, have a climate smart or climate resilient uh, solution. We are working predominantly here in Kenya. We have a very small setup in Rwanda and a little outreach in Uganda. And definitely I wanna to go to Ethiopia, but the rules of the game there are a bit more complicated. Data collection, that's what we are here for. That's why we talk what we are talking about. I like that remark in the bottom, data have no value. And that's all because data are outdated at the moment when you collect them. Data analysis is the only thing that has value. Um, but we want to have, uh, we want to collect data because we are convinced that unemotional decision-making is the way forward. And you can only make, or a farmer can only make decisions, clear unemotional decisions if the data are correct. What I think is, or what we think is very important is that each farmer needs his or her own solution. You cannot canvas solutions because what well, soil is different, temperature is different, altitude is different, crops are different and farmers are different. But if you have good data, then you can have tailor-made solutions for each farmer. Um, through the network of the guys, well, again, you see them here, um, we have strong relations with farmers, not, our, not us from the office, but in the field. Trust is a very, very important uh, element. Now, until now, everybody has been talking about collecting data, sharing data, uh, interpreting data, data analysis, etc. Nobody has been talking about the word trust. And I think here in East Africa, I don't know about West Africa or uh, Southern Africa, trust is a key thing because people don't want to share their information with somebody they don't trust. People don't want to uh, get an advice from someone they don't trust. People are not going to put their money into another system if they don't trust it. It is uh, every every decision the farmer makes or has to make is built on do I trust the person I'm wor working with? And I really don't know if that person, that personal role can ever be replaced by a digital tool. It can support, but I don't think it can replace. Um, one of the reasons why we do data collection is because our donors ask it. And I feel very awkward about that because we do it, we put quite some money in there, we share the data and it's all in an ethical way, but I'm pretty sure it's ending somewhere in a big drawer and nobody's ever gonna do anything with it. Data have no value, but data analysis has value. Now, I think, um, from our experience in the field, farmers are getting more and more reluctant to share data. We get remarks like yet another survey. Uh, we already did a baseline study uh, three weeks ago. Why do we have to do that again? Um, so there's getting a kind of tiredness there, especially because all these data are not going to be returned to farmers Farmers don't get the incentive of why share data. So I think for us, everybody is working with data. That is going to be one of the more important things. We have to be able to make clear to someone why he has to or she has to give that information to us. One of my big calls uh, is that we have to standardize data. And that's what we, we have been talking about before. As long as there's no standardization of data, you cannot share databases. The purpose is to share databases. If we don't do that, then there is ne never gonna be any learning. And I always like to uh, well, poke a, bit, a little bit. 
but every organization has a database. We have a database of about 200,000 farmers and Colorado just said they have a database of 6.1 million farmers and everybody is somewhere in between there. But everybody has been spending money to build that database. And I did a little bit uh, of research and I think it's between five and $15 per farmer in a database. Just trying to think about that amount of money that's been spent there. I've never ever seen a budget where somebody said, there's also a cost for maintenance of a database. That means that everybody thinks in projects, at the end of the project, the file is closed, shelved, and then we start again with a new project. And even NGOs have, well, they work so much in silos that they cannot bank on the previous project, or there's probably even legal restrictions not to do it that have not been taken care of all the way before. Um, I think this is this waste that's been created is our responsibility. We have to think about how we can make that easier, easier for farmers and easier for the wallet because we are wasting so much money. Um, one of the funny things is that uh, that's the bottom line here. More and more often when we ask farmers to sign up or to register on our app or to share data in a survey, they sense that we are gonna make money with it. And they literally ask, how much are we making and how are you gonna return that? How are we gonna return that to the farmers? Um, challenges in data collection, lots of money, no standardization, unclear use, it's expensive, that's lots of, mo lots of money. Every organization has their own database and there's so many uh, overlaps. Every database shelf after a project, no reuse is waste, it lost money. Illegal and unethical use of data. Illegal, that's maybe a bit far flung, but unethical, that's quite clear. Nobody knows what the responsibilities are, or few people know that. And a lot of people are hiding behind, oh, I didn't know, while they are giving away databases. So I think we have to be uh, very keen on that. We did a very, that's probably, I, I'll, I'll go into that later, but we did a very short um, training with farmers on informed consent and data sharing and non-informed consent. So half of the farmers were trained about, this is what data sharing means. The other half, we didn't train about them. We gave them the same consent form. And all the groups signed it in the same way, meaning the power of the trainer was much more important than the power of the training. If the trainer said, I fill it out, just say yes, or I'll fill it out, just say no. And they were, all giving consent on data sharing without actually realizing what it was. I found it quite interesting. So that means that our ethical uh, standards have to be very high. We have to be sure that farmers understand what, what they are talking about. And if they don't understand it, we still have to talk ethic eth think ethically. Altogether, I think Everyone who works in the agri-sphere, agri together we have to build a, build a shared database. I, uh, I'm of a specific age, and we used to have a phone directory when we had landlines. I was responsible for the data in that phone directory. If it was wrong, I would call the phone company and say, ah, you made a mistake, you have to print that whole book again because my name is spelled wrongly. Um, and of course they didn't. But it was my responsibility to take care that it was in there correctly. I think we have to make a database of farmers or the whole agriculture hemisphere, but the data should be owned by the farmers, not by anyone else. We can help farmers to get it in there correctly. We can help farmers to make decisions about sharing, but it is their data and they have to know that they're missing out if it is in there in the wrong way. Analysis of all these data, of course, that is not the farmers. Then there is evidence or there is a good reason to keep the data clean. Um, 
the management of the database should, excuse me, I don't know if there's Colorado government representatives here, but it should not be in the hand of the government. Sorry to say that, but as long as government is being mentioned in ownership of those kind of data or databases or whatever, farmers will probably be very reluctant to share the data. So if we put that ownership or that management in the hands of an NGO or a trusted organization that manages, manages 